scripture memory verse tonight, Proverbs 19, 20. Listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. Proverbs 19, 20. Anybody else? Mine says accept discipline. Listen to counsel and accept discipline. Maybe that's because that's what I need to hear. That's what mine says. That. <laughs> what version is it, Aaron? Uh, the... Uh, <coughs> New American Standard. Yeah. Listen to counsel and accept discipline that you may be wise the rest of your days. That's good. You know, 19 is, if you read through the Proverbs, today is the 19th too, so if you were reading through the Proverbs, you'd have read this today. Anybody else? Proverbs 19, 20? Proverbs 19, 20. Listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. Proverbs 19. Good job, Mike. Anybody else? Proverbs 19.20. Listen to counsel and... <laughs> I threw you off with and my different version. And receive instruction that you might be wise in your latter days. Uh, Proverbs 19.20. Good job. Anybody else? Proverbs 19.20. Listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. Proverbs 19.20. Good job, Dana. Anybody else? <coughs> Proverbs 19.20. Listen to counsel and receive instruction that you might be wise in your latter days. Proverbs 19.20. Good job. Anybody else? <laughs> She's like shaking her head. I always mess with her so we can try it. Now, Aaron, read yours again, please. Listen to counsel and accept discipline that you may be wise the rest of your days. I like it. I like it. NASB. That's what Tom <coughs> Camp always taught from. Yeah, that's why I got one. Yeah. So I can keep up. It's always sure. better. Uh, the NASB is like uh, probably college age reading level. The New King James is about 10th grade. You go down to the NIV, you get to about 7th grade. You know, so there's different levels of where you're reading at. And so the NASB is one of the hardest. It's the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it's the newest of the scrolls that have been found, but the oldest that they have found. And so it's really good. And a lot of times it's upside, like it's upside down from the King James or the New King James. Here's the interesting thing is that the word really is here. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so instead of listen, see, now we've got down listen, but it's hear, hearken. And that's what the King James has it as, is hear, because you want to hear, and it, and it actually means to hear intelligently or with paying attention to obedience. Because it's not just any counsel or any discipline, any instruction. Think about it, because you could go, well, I, I heard some good counsel. I was supposed to put some mustard on it because I burnt myself. And so now you've got to go, well, well what, wait a minute. That's good counsel according to who? I need to take a pill for it. That's good counsel according to who? They need to listen to me because this is about hearing the word of God. This is about hearing the word of God. And, I, and, and that's what we've got to understand is that as people of God in this Bible that's the love letter from God, 66 books by 40 authors, this is not giving you anywhere else to go. Salvation is coming back into the family of God, and they didn't listen to God. And now he's saying, hear my word, hear my counsel, hear my instruction so that you can live. And faith comes by hearing. And so we don't want to be double-minded like James tells us, because double-mindedness is this. I hear the word of God, and I say, no, I don't like that. I want something else. And I go to where I've got another mind. But we're supposed to put on the mind of Christ. And it says, Behold, it is written in the, in the volume of the book, Behold, I have come to do thy will, O God. So we want to hear, we want to listen to what God has to say with the intent to obey it. Now, you might say, well, I, I haven't got no capacity. By faith, you obey it. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And we want to hear his counsel. We want to hear his word. We want to understand it, which is, some other things that go with it is uh, to hear intelligently, to understand it, 
to listen, to uh, attend to it. Why, Greg? So you can announce what it says and be a witness of it. Listen, why would you want to listen to counsel? Why would you want to learn how to take an engine apart? I'm just going to fix my truck. No, I want to be able to show somebody else. I want to be able to instruct them. I want to be able to disciple them and let them know how to take that engine apart and pass it on to somebody else. And we're great with that when it becomes a doctor, a lawyer, a nurse. It becomes a mechanic. But what about the word of God where I hear the counsel of God? I hear the voice of God. I come out of the grave where I was dead at and I let him lead me and I go out with power to tell others what I heard from God. That's how the whole Bible got written. Men, holy men of God, heard the voice of God, the word of God, the instruction of God. They believed God. How did it start? With Abraham from Ur of Chaldean. He had nothing to go on. They were all serving pagan gods, and he heard his voice. And what did he do? By faith, he believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he left out. Did he do it perfectly? No. It said, leave your whole family. And what did he do? He took Lot with him. And he hung out in Haran, which means dry. And when you're not obeying God fully, it's going to be dry. And they hung out in Haran until his dad died. When his dad died, then he moved on. And God gave him the 12-fold promise because he began to listen better. He began to, to walk by faith. And that's the way we all grow. But it has to be by hearing God's voice. First usage. Guess where the first usage? I love to do this. First usage. Genesis 3.8 is the first usage when they weren't listening. Listen to me. Adam, where are you? We heard your voice and we were afraid because we were naked and we hid. See, we're good at hearing other voices, but now we've come to salvation. We want to get back to hearing what God has to say about life. Not arguing with people, not contending with people, just sharing and witnessing the truth by our words and by our deeds. Listen to me. That's the first usage. What's the second usage, Greg? I'm glad you asked. It's in Genesis 11, 7. God used it at the Tower of Babel. Listen, look at Genesis 11, 7. This is where this word is used at. Genesis is the origins. It's where we want to go back to. You might think a word means something in the, uh, further in the Bible, but if you don't go back to where it began at and get the origins of it, you might have a different definition because where's the attack at? It's on the Word of God. Well, what did God intend it to say? What did he mean for it to say? Not what do we now call it. Listen, remember we've done this a million times. Intercourse. It's now got a sexual connotation. But really, intercourse was about fellowship. It was about social intercourse where you and I are interacting and witnessing and talking about the Word of God. And we turned it into a sexual act that is no good. And now we go <laughs> and giggle when we say it. But it's really about me and you having an intimate relationship with God together and hearing His Word and going out and telling others with power, with boldness. But in 11.7, what happened? God had to come down and give them grace and mercy and not destroy them, but confuse their languages. If it says 11.7, you can read it later. It's the Tower of Babel. It's the same uh, spirit that's trying to destroy the world right now, uh, and God has really, really brought it under judgment. Uh, notice, I gotta find seven first. Does yours guys start with the word come? Come, let us go down. Is that seven in your book? Mm -hmm. I got a bunch of lines and I can't see the seven. Come, let us, Elohim, us, just the triune God, go down. They always have to condense in and come down to us. And there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Guess where the word here is that they may not understand. Listen, because we want to hear with the intent to obey and understand what God is saying. 
Here, he's confusing them because they're trying to join together in union in one mind to come against his judgment. So he's using the same word to keep them from understanding each other. But in the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost, what did he do? He gave us the ability once again with the Spirit in us to hear his voice, be led out of the grave, and walk in the newness of life. And understand what he would say to the church. Listen, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit would say to the church. Not what the pastor says. Not what the book somebody wrote says. Not what the song says. But what the Spirit is saying to the man and woman of God in the church. Now, it's always going to line up with the character and the nature of God in the Bible. But look how we're changing the Bible. We've got all of these translations, and now we're calling the Holy Spirit the wind words. We're saying things to try to make people understand it like a newspaper instead of saying, sit down and be still before God and listen to his voice and ask the Holy Spirit to teach you the word of God so you can go out and be a witness of God after you hear the counsel of God. That's what the scripture is talking about. It's a lot. That's why I was thinking about teaching Proverbs. But we could go for years in there. I did once already. So it's a fun book to learn. Oh, well, that's not applicable for today, is it? Really? The Bible is just as applicable today for every situation in life as it was when it was written, as it was when it was given by word of mouth and passed down by the uh, Jewish people. But what did they do? They developed a form of godliness that forgot the power thereof. They forgot the God who sent them, who called them, who was speaking to them. And they came up with their own little counsel and their own ways of doing things. And we've done it again in the church today. And that's why we're apostate. And that's why we sing, I will not forget you, to remind us not to forget who this is about. It's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. So, here, oh yeah, listen, but you know how many times the kids go, I hear you, they're listening, but they don't do anything different. Boy, don't do that, you hear me? Uh-huh, and they keep doing the same thing. We're just like that, with God training us. Man, did you hear that? I heard that today, I heard, I was watching that, and I seen that, and you go off and you just keep doing the same thing. See, we want to ask God to give us a heart to obey not to be hearers only but to be doers of the word so that we're not deceiving ourselves and we all need to hear this and we need to be reminded of this and this is what fellowship is about this is a what when we sit around and, and talk you know how fun it is to talk about the word of god i don't know if you guys know but i i, I love to talk with the word of god with my son or anybody that i, I can meet somebody from florida on the phone me and my wife sat one night for almost two hours talking to a lady on the phone in South Africa who was a Christian, and we were just like we were old friends because she knew the Word of God, and we knew the Word of God, and we were talking about it, and it was just amazing. I don't know if you've ever met people and you go, wow, it's like we've known each other. We're in the same family. Of course we know each other in the spirit. I better quit. I'm going somewhere else, and we need to get back here. Listen, you guys hear this? Here. Here, it's not a, it, it, it's not it's not a, an accident that the word here is here. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What was it that Eve didn't hear? She wanted to hear another voice. She wanted to hear something else. We want other counsel. We want to be double-minded. But when we decide once and for all that this salvation is real and that God has saved our life, and that no matter what, they can't kill me. They can't, they can't, I mean, they can kill me, but they can't take my soul because he owns it now. He bought it with this precious blood of his son. And so I'm going to hear him and try to do by his spirit, by his power, by his might, everything he calls me to do, no matter what anybody else says, because you want to hear his voice. Listen to me, I'm telling you, because they're raising up prophets with lying signs and wonders, they, both in the church and out of the church. They've got us all going, Tucker, where's Tucker at? Uh, what's Trump doing next? They've got all the, and, and you want to be a conservative? Why would you want to be a conservative when you can be a Christian? I'm sorry, I'll get a little loud here. 
Why would your identity be in being a conservative? Why not be a Christian if you know Jesus? Listen to me, because you're unequally yoked with a bunch of conservatives that don't know Jesus, and you'd rather listen to what they're saying about the next election instead of what Jesus is saying about judgment right now. And we've got to wake up to this, because we're hearing the wrong voice. We're listening to the wrong person, and you can't come out of the grave. You can't have salvation and life and that more abundantly, listening to the voice of Babylon just because it looks a little bit more moral. Listen, Christ already dealt with the sin issue. Quit looking at somebody and going, well, they've got a good education, and they're not cussing, and they're pretty moral. They don't know Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, you're underneath the sway of the wicked one, and your eyes haven't been opened. They might know Jesus in the future, but right now, don't hear their counsel. Don't listen to their counsel. I'm serious. If you're dealing with a banker and they don't know Jesus, Get some other banking information, and then in wise counsel, make your decision if you can't find a Christian banker. Make a wise decision based upon what the Spirit of God tells you to do after you talk to several people. Don't just trust them. They're not in your family if they don't have Jesus. And just because they say they have Jesus, be very careful. I believe. What do you believe? How has it changed your life? Where's the evidence of your salvation? Are you hearing his voice? Are you listening to his counsel? Have you received instruction? Then why are you still doing what you're doing? Think about it. This is the word of God. We could talk about this one line all night long if we really look at it because you cannot exhaust the character of God. You cannot exhaust what he's saying to us because he loves us so much. You can sit down and meditate and chew on one verse for weeks and go, wow. The riches of Christ. What in the world is this? It, it, it makes no sense that he would love us. That he would give us grace and mercy and be long-suffering and wait on us. So, are you hearing? Are you hearing counsel? Or are you following somebody else's voice? Because when you're following somebody else's voice, you'll hide from this word. You'll hide from fellowship. You'll hide from church. You'll be okay to go somewhere else and hide. That's what they did. We heard your voice and we hid. This is the first usage where we see it in the Bible. Sadly, it's not the other way around. Because it would be great that with God's people, it would be they're hearing his voice. And he knows them and they're following him. What is it John 10, 28? Is that right? My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Okay hear with intelligently listen don't listen i mean because this is the problem we've got i'm going to go here again i'm sorry this is the problem we've got we're letting phds and people that go to college and are indoctrinated and are need to sway the wicked one tell us what intelligence is why would we let the world tell us what intelligence is when they don't know jesus Shouldn't we let the Spirit of God tell us what intelligence is? I am not being mean. Listen, I've seen some brilliant people. I've sat and talked with brilliant people at Purdue, but they don't know Jesus. So they don't understand. And I'm able to contend with them because I know the Word of God. Because all you have to do is lay the Word of God in their lap. Just one little simple scripture. Lay it right in their lap. And they're going to go, blah, 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 blah. They will. I'm serious. They're living in a dichotomy. We understand it's a trichotomy. We know the Spirit of God is on our side. The boldness is on our side. The truth is on our side. And that's why you see, when you see Jacob come down to Egypt, he's coming down with nothing. He doesn't even have food. There's a famine in the land. And he, what does he do? First thing he does, he goes to Pharaoh and blesses him. The lesser blesses the greater. But the church doesn't get their identity. We don't get that we know the living God and that he saved us and we're in his family and he wants us to hear his counsel and go and witness it to other people and not to be afraid to do that, not to be rude, not to be sailors. Or I don't want to be mean to sailors, but, but there's good sailors, but the, the, the connotation is has always been tattoos and, 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 and speaking a little bit rude and, and cussing and, boy, that's, that's half the church nowadays, so I've got to be careful or I'll get in trouble. Their anchor's not in the right place, is all I can say. 
So listen to me as I rattle and rattle and rattle. Um, are you hearing intelligently the word of God? Are you coming to the word of God and coming to fellowship and coming to God to hear so that he can sanctify and cleanse you with the washing of the water through the word? Or are you looking for a position? Are you looking for a place? Are you looking to learn some knowledge so somebody will be impressed with you? Or are you looking to hear with the intent to obey? This is, this is very important that we understand this because everything we need is in Christ. He is our all in all. <clears throat> he is our all in all. And in fact... You can listen to wrong counsel. Look at Psalms 1. Remember when we just did Psalms 1 not too long ago? Psalms 1 tells us, walking, standing, and setting. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Why is the church quoting ungodly people, following ungodly people? Why is the church reading ungodly people's books? And acting like that they're getting intelligent and smart and that they can run a race to win by faith by listening to this type of trash that is, is based in psychology and sociology and earthly wisdom that's sensual and demonic. Where are we at in the church today? I'm not being mean here. I'm just talking out loud, just off the cuff. Or no, hopefully by the Spirit. Look, this is what Psalms tells us. Blessed is the man and the woman, using a masculine pronoun. There's, there, there, there's a spirit here in a woman, and she's called for one thing. There's a spirit in a man, he's called for another thing. We all make up the body of Christ, and it's written in a masculine sense because God created man, Adam, first, and then he took out of the man a woman, out of the rib, out of the side, the same way the church was birthed out of Christ's side on the cross. He took her out of his side, so I can't t become uh, the bride and then want to dominate the head. That's changing the gospel instead of the gospel changing me. I'm coming to, to Christ as, as the, the, the weaker vessel looking for the head to protect me, to take care of me, to die for me. And that's the example we have to have with marriage and life and family and godliness and it comes from the counsel of God. No matter whether the world is apostate or, or evil and doesn't want to receive the truth, we still have to talk about the truth and witness about the truth and be about the truth even when we mess up. Truth is, I'm sorry, Lord, I repent. That was really stupid. That was sin. Call it sin. Because he's already forgiven us for all of our sin. So look, blessed is the man who does what? He walks. This is how you're living. This is not my general walk. This is not how I'm treading about and traversing in this earth. I am not walking according to the counsel, the advice, the purpose, the teaching, the planning, the doctrine of ungodly people. I'm sorry, I have a problem with it. And people get mad at me, but, but, but you know, I, I say this all the time. Listen to the music they're singing. It's evil. Look at the books they're telling you that this is great literature and you should be listening to this and, and this is the books we want you to read in our schools and they're training people in ungodliness and then they want to act like the church wanting to teach truth and the love of God and mercy and grace and service and, and, and all these things is wrong when they're teaching ungodliness and they want you to read the worst books on the planet. They want to put them into the kindergartner's curriculum. And they want them to grow up reading these ungodly books. And they take the Bible out, the advice and the purpose and the plans of God out of the school. And then they become a religious system. The synagogues of Satan right before our faces. And Christians do nothing about it except send their kids to it. That's pretty crazy, isn't it, when you look at it like that? It's like... What are we doing? It doesn't mean everybody in that system is demonic. It means they don't understand the spiritual war and the battle going on around them and the waves crashing over and getting ready to drown them. They don't understand what they're a part of because they weren't taught the scriptures when they were young. I know, I get in trouble for this stuff. Blessed is the man who walks not in the council of the ungodly, nor stands. See, because if you start walking it, the next thing you know, you're going to go, oh, I do feel pretty good about this walking in this, and I'm learning a little bit, so now I'm going to stand here and talk about it. 
Listen, but if you're walking in the Word of God, you're going to want to stand around and talk about the Word of God with people. If you're in the Word of God, reading the Word of God, and crying out to God, and you're hearing His counsel, you're receiving His instruction, you're going to walk in the Word. You're going to walk by faith, and you're going to want to stand around and tell people about Jesus. Nor set, because this is the progression. What you're walking in, you're going to stand in, and then you're going to sit down in it. You're going to take a throne in it, if it's the world. But he says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, which he meditates in it day and night. See that? And he shall be like a tree, an oak of righteousness, planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Don't we want to be prosperous? I better run away from this. I just wanted you to see that you can actually, actually say, I believe in Jesus, and yet sit around and walk in the world and listen to ungodly counsel, and then begin to apply it to your life, and it have no ability to change who you are whatsoever, because it's earthly, central, demonic. It's there to cheat you and spoil you out of Christ, who is the head of, 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 the, of all uh, principalities and powers. And you have to be careful, because they will cheat you, they will spoil you, with philosophy and empty deceit according to the, the basic principles of this world, but not according to Christ, who is the head. He's the head of the body of Christ. So where should we be reading at? Where should we be going to? We should be in prayer, in the word, in fellowship. If we want to put on the mind of Christ, shouldn't he be our professor? Shouldn't the Holy Spirit be leading us to hear the counsel of God? And then we have a choice. Listen, you can hear it all day long. We're talking about it right now. You can, you can, do, but then you got to receive it. That's what he says. You got to receive this instruction. You can't just hear it. Many people hear it, but not with the intent to obey. They hear it. They go out the door, and the devil steals the seed from their heart. They go, man, that ain't going to work for me because you know what? I got to go do this, and, and I got boys that are in baseball, and they got to go, and they're going to be the next. And they're going to go, man, they're good at this. And, and I've got money invested in these summer leagues. And, man, we're going to. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're being deceived. You need to make sure your kids make it to heaven, not to the major leagues. If they make it to the major leagues because you're making it, make sure they make it to heaven, then praise the Lord. But your intent should not be to get them to the major leagues. It should be to train them in the way that they're supposed to go. And when they're older... They will not depart therefrom. So, listen, hear intelligently the counsel of God, the advice of God, uh, so that you can announce it and publish it and proclaim it and tell others about it as a witness for God. And the counsel has the implication, listen, it's the plan of God. It's, it's just the plan of God. That's what the counsel is. See, it's all set in place. Every bit of it's set. His plan is set in place. He's not going, oh my goodness, Greg didn't listen to that. Now i got to go move over here and get this taken care of and get that taken care of. He's outside of time. So his plan is already finished. It's finished completely. So the counsel is his advice. Notice he's not forcing it on you. He never forces. He's a gentleman. It's there freely if you want it. It's there freely. He'll give you as much as you want. It's freely there. It's his advice. Do you think God's advice is better than the world's advice? I mean, I'm serious. Most Christians don't. I talk to them all the time. And they can tell me everything about, you know, philosophy. They can tell me about what the professor said, but if you start talking about Scripture, they want to get away. They want to get way away from you. And yet they'll go, I believe. This is not to shame anybody. This is like sounding an alarm, ringing a bell. Wake up, and Christ will give you light. Arise from the dead. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. Finding out what the will of the Lord is. 
be always be being filled with the Holy Spirit of promise. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always to God the Father through Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. That's what we're called to do. Can't do it in the flesh. Can't do it listening to ungodly counsel. Can't do it unless we hear the advice of God and we believe what he says and we follow him. That first usage is a crazy one too. Deuteronomy 32. Listen, first usage of, of uh, counsel or advice. Again, same way. They hid themselves. What's Deuteronomy 32? It's the song of Moses. Remember when Moses sang the song? <laughs> it's interesting. What is it? A funeral gig? Is it a funeral song that he's singing? Because he's telling them, you're a stiff-necked people. You're not going to listen to God. And I'm getting ready to go up here on Mount Nebo and die. And you're going to go into the promised land and ignore the voice of God and the plan of God. And then he sings them a song. I'm serious. But remember, we, we just did we just covered this in uh, uh, 2 Kings 22. When they send the book of the law that they found, uh, it, it's actually where he tells them in 31 to put a book of the law and read it every seven years. And that's how Josiah revived. But look at 31, 27. He says, for I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. If today, while I am yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord, then how much more after my death? And then he sings them a song. And, the, and it's 3228. <clears throat> you can go read it later and sing, read the whole song. I'd love to read it because he talks about the name of God. He talks about the latter days, the last days, same way this verse does. But he actually says in verse 28, for they are a nation void of counsel, godly counsel, nor is there any understanding in them. Now listen to me, because when you listen and hear God's word with an intent to obey, you gain understanding. And he says they're a nation void. That's why they're rebellious. That's why they don't understand that life is in hearing his voice. How did we become to death? How did original sin happen? When they ceased listening to his voice, they started hiding. And Eve was deceived. Adam wasn't deceived. So all the men that want to try to blame a woman instead of protecting a woman, we're supposed to be protecting women. And our nation is upside down. And they've done a great job of, of, of uh, um, changing women's identity and men's identity and then trying to say now that there is no identity. It's fluid. You can be whatever you want to be. That's not what God said. Somebody hasn't heard God's counsel. Somebody hasn't been listening and receiving instruction. Somebody hasn't been witnessing in the street and saying, wait a minute. And it's the church that has walked away, that is apostate, that has made up their own system that would kill their own Christ if he came today, the same way that Israel did. And that happened like that. On the 10th of the sun, they chose him. On the 14th, they killed him. Because he didn't obey. And what did they do? They go, no, nope, we're listening to the ungodly counsel of the world that, that is not following God. And they said, choose Barabbas, the son of the father. They said, choose the Antichrist. And here we sit getting ready to do it again. And we're listening to the voices of the world. And, and it's worse yet. They're not, it's not just the voice of the world. You can look at them. They mock you. They mock you. They say, here is a medium. Which one would you like? The TV? The radio? Which medium would you like to listen to? The newspaper? The book? Which channel would you like to turn it to? We'll channel some spirits with some other information for you. You can listen to all these voices on a 587 channels. They're channeling spirits that got a different message. It's got nothing to do with the Word of God. Even if you turn it to the Christian station, you're not hearing the Word of God. And the counsel of God, I'm sorry, I'll get a little excited on you. And what do we do? Yet we still say, wow, 
What do we do? Well, I, 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 would, I would submit to you that, that we never were supposed to be changing society, so quit trying and go out and tell people what you hear and witness to one soul at a time and be a reconciler of souls. Get involved in the ministry of reconciliation because that's all God's doing anyway. He's going to burn this other stuff up. They can keep being rebellious. He gave them grace. He, he separated so they couldn't talk to each other and understand and gave them grace until his son came and still they hardened their hearts. Still they would not listen to the word of God and he's going to judge them one day but we don't have to be running headlong into hell with them. We don't have to be feeding our kids the same meal that they're eating, the same TV, the same mediums, the same spirits, the same lies. Because God's going to kill them. Same way he killed Saul for, for calling up a medium, for calling up a spirit. He killed Saul. The first king. I love this stuff. So, I would take God's advice, and it, it implies his plan, his plan is perfect. His plan is perfect, that he would come down and die and give us a free will choice, that we could be conformed into his image because he would come and live inside of us and change us if we would just desire to come after him and to surrender to him and hear his voice and obey. He would give us the power. He gives us everything needed to become sons of God. To as many as who, uh, uh, what does it say in uh, John 1, 11 and 12? He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But to as many as received him, he gave the privilege, the power to believe in him and become sons of God. I paraphrased it, chopped it up, go read it yourself. It's 1, 11. My brain went crooked because I was trying to define something. Listen to me. He's done it all for us. You don't have to do anything but stand in his victory. Stand and hand out, witness the spoils of the truth when you hear it. And when you hear it and you hand it out, you'll own it. It'll become your identity. You'll understand that it's your family. And it's what you're called to do is to save souls. To be a living light, a living word of God to others. A letter that they can read because your life has been changed. Not that you're perfect. No, Jesus is perfect. We're not perfect. We're being perfected. If we were perfect, they would never want to talk to us. <laughs> Man, I ain't going nowhere near them people. They're perfect. They don't mess up. I, they sweat it and it smells good. I am not <laughs> going near them. No, they need to see our flaws. They need to see us apologizing. They need to see if God just made us perfect. Boom! That's positionally. That's up there. Nobody can see that right now. But we know it's our identity. Practically... We're stumbling through. But we don't have to stumble the way that, that dead people stumble. Because we have life now, salvation now. We know the future now. We know everything about it, and it's at our fingertips. Yet we'll go read something else and ignore the Bible. We'll go watch something else and ignore God's voice. Listen, my house should be a house of prayer. I would encourage you to start there and listen for the voice of God, and he'll tell you where to go next. Start in prayer. Spends five minutes with him going, Lord, what's going on with my witness? So, hear counsel, hear his advice, or we end up, look at our nation, how it ends up. We're void of counsel. And there's no understanding in our nation. Really? Men can go in women's locker rooms? Really? Fluidity? Really? Marriage is anybody you want to marry? Really? Think about it. We have no understanding whatsoever. Think about it. What does understanding mean? Standing under it. I'm not standing underneath that wisdom. Uh-uh. I want to stand next to God's wisdom. That wisdom is delusional and will end in death. And he has given us life. Receive. Yeah, you end up like that with no, no you're void of counsel. You're void of God's word is what that means. Um, and you have no understanding. And then he says, receive instruction. Receive means to admit, to take, to choose. And I love this. The first usage is in Exodus 21.5. <clears throat> Think about this for a minute because this is amazing. I, I'm sorry. My brain will pop. My little brain will pop. 
The first uses of this word for receive is when they were building the tabernacle in the wilderness. And they had them big uh, uh, five inch curtains <clears throat> and they put the clasp on them and, and they hooked them together. That's the first time they used the word receive because they all built their parts together and then they received each other and they became one and it was a house for God in the wilderness to worship God because they were obeying instruction. And it's the same thing New Testament. We're living stones being chipped away at, fitted together as a holy house where God can live and he can be our head and we're supposed to be fitting together. We're supposed to be receiving instruction that binds us together with the mind of Christ to be one together to do the same thing for the reconciliation of other souls. That's so amazing to me that I'm like, I'm a pop Lord. That's what the word receive means here. Listen, you got to go back to where God uses it at. You got to look what God is meaning by receive. I got, you know, I got a buddy that says, I got the gift of receiving, so you can give him anything you want to give him. And that's the way the church has become. They sit around waiting for somebody to give them something, but they don't want to go to God. They don't want to go to God and get it and then go witness it and tell somebody what they heard. They want somebody to give them some stuff, which is going to burn, which does nothing for your soul. Listen, I get it. All things are lawful, but they're not all profitable. They're not going to conform you into the image of Christ. They're not going to burn away the dross. They're not going to cause you to go out and witness in fact, they will destroy your salvation, and you might have a saved soul, but you'll have a lost life if you don't begin to hear counsel and receive. Take it. Take this. Take. Choose it. Let it be clasped to the one another ministry where we're joined together in it, doing it together. And then they see a body of Christ, and they see people that really have love for one another, and they know that we're his disciples. Receive what, Greg? Instruction. Now think about this for a minute because you're not going to get this really, but I'm not getting it real good. But I think of instruction, I'm like, I just bought this thing in the mail and I don't know how to put it together, but there's some instructions with it. And it's got pictures and it's got little call outs. It's got numbers. It tells me how to fit all these pieces together. But this word here really means <laughs> chastisement. Because think about it, we're all born dead, we're all wrong, we all have to repent and change our mind. So now he's burning out the dross, he's chastising us, he's rebuking us, he's saying, here it is, here's my love that I would tell you you're wrong. In one thing at a time, I'm giving you instruction. And all I'm asking you to do is hear that, receive it, and turn. It's instruction. Listen, I know we look at instruction differently instruction, it's chastisement, it's reproof, it's warning or instruction, it's correction. Yes, it's doctrine, because once you receive it, now you know that doctrine is right living before God. And so now you know what righteousness looks like because I've received it now. So then I know when I cross the boundary and go, oh, I wasn't following that. And it's, it's got the connotation again, and I could, I could teach on this for months, guys, of, 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 of a parent correcting a child. Because that's what God is. He's a loving father who sent a son who did it perfectly. And then now he has to give us instruction and say, look, at, look, it's Jesus. Look, look what Jesus did. There's your instruction. Hear the voice of Jesus. That's your instruction. Hear his counsel. That's your advice. Think about it. We, we talk about it all the time. When the man of God, and yes, the woman of God, looks into the word of God and sees the son of God, that's what we're looking for, the perfect man, the perfect God-man, God with us, Emmanuel, it's an instruction manual, if you will. When he sees the man of God, he's transformed by the Spirit of God into the image of God for the glory of God. That's what we're looking to do, to be conformed into his image. Not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind so we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's the instruction. So it's always going to come... The chastisement doesn't have to be took me to the woodshed and beat me. Chastisement can be correct that. Stand that back up again. You let it fall over and you really need to stand it up. Think about it. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. What are we told? All scripture is God breathed. All counsel from God's word. Everything you're going to hear from God is God breathed. It's the word of God. It's living. 
and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, and yes, the woman of God, might be thoroughly equipped and ready for every good work. And there's no good work unless it's you're being his workmanship, unless you're doing the work of God, which is the reconciliation of souls. That's the only work he's doing right now. He gave his only begotten, one and only son to reconcile souls. All the other work is busyness or busy being under, this, being under Satan's yoke. That's what it is. If it's not about redemption. Now listen, we're going to grow to that. We can have a whole lot of busyness right now in our life. But if we don't know the truth, the instruction of God, the chastisement of God to say get the busyness out and get focused on walking circumspectly, not living as fools but as wise, redeeming the time. If we don't hear that truth, we just think I'm going to do like the Christians down the road are doing. They said a prayer, they went to an altar, they believed, and they did nothing. So we think we're okay doing nothing. But that's not what God's word ever teaches. What did he do when he created Adam? Adam, come here. Tend the garden. He gave him something to do. Go get a dog. You need to give it something to do. Dog's important because Caleb means dog. Guess who got across the Jordan with Joshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. Caleb is the only one that crossed of that generation. And his name means dog because he was worshiping. How was he worshiping, Greg? He believed God. And it was accounted to him as righteousness. There was 10 of them that didn't. Listen, for every, I don't know if that means 2 out of 10 believe. And I don't know what it means. But I know there was 12 of them that went and spied out the <clears> land. All 12 of them came back carrying that one cluster of grapes on a stick. And it bounced. And they're going, man, these giants in the land. But look at the grapes. Look at the fruit. Go take the land. Oh, uh -uh, we can't go up there. <laughs> Serious, we do the same thing today. How am I going to witness to my boss? How am I going to say that to my teacher? How am I going to? I can't do that. That's unbelief. Wasn't that the sin of Eve? She didn't believe God. She listened to another voice. Maybe it was her own. Maybe it was some voice in her head. I don't know. But she didn't listen to God's voice. She didn't hear his counsel. She didn't receive his instruction that came to her head. And then he said, Remember, he wasn't deceived, but he gets the blame for it. He said, already, whoa, man. And he followed that woman instead of following God. And they both got asked to leave the garden. I'm serious. That's what happened. Eve was deceived. Adam went because he didn't want to lose the woman. And he walked away from God and chose the other relationship and let her be boss. What happened, Greg? Well, they had a couple kids, and one killed the other one. Because the wages of sin is death. It's here too. It's actually here. It's actually here. Um, did I not bring that up? Ooh. Ooh. I didn't bring it up, did I? Oh, we're getting ready, we're getting ready to come to it. Never mind. First usage here in a minute we'll get to it so are you listening to counsel can you hear the counsel of God or are you hearing the counsel of a man listen because there's a whole bunch of people teaching the Bible and man they got big churches and they got a lot of people going to their church doesn't that scare you I had a pastor tell me the other night that he's at a church and he went down there and it's growing and there's over 500 people and they just buying a church for 1200 people and I'm like Oh my goodness, dude! You guys better quit. And I, and people think I'm a knucklehead. You better quit. We're in apostasy. We're at the end of the age. And if your church is growing exponentially like that, there's probably something wrong. You're feeding them the world. You're giving them some stuff that's not in the Bible. I'm serious because the flesh hates God. Now you might think I'm crazy, but you better inspect. If they're flying through the doors and you're telling them to repent of their sin and you're telling them to hear instruction, you're telling them to die to themselves and you're telling them to quit chasing the world and start living for Jesus and telling people about reconciliation of souls 
and, 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 and your church is filling up, you better be careful. Joel Osteen filled up a whole stadium. I'm just telling you the truth. We're living in apostasy right now. My Bible says that apostasy has to happen. The falling away from the faith has to happen because they listen to Janus and Jamborees, these magicians, these Chaldeans, these Babylonian liars. They have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof, the power of the Holy Spirit, God himself, who wants to come down and tabernacle with us and live in a heart not made with hands, but made by him, created for him and his good pleasure, created to worship him and bow down to him and to hear his counsel, receive his instruction so that you can become like him from a free will choice because he first loved us, not because he created something and said, you now will serve me. But because we chose to, what a magnificent plan God has that's perfectly set in motion. How many saints that have went before us that are already there because it's beautiful in the eyes of the Lord, the death of his saints, both physically and spiritually. We're born dead. You become a saint when you hear his voice. There's saints and ain'ts. You hear his voice and you come to life. Now you've got a choice. Do I want to hear any more of his voice? His spirit comes and live in you. Why would you not want to hear his voice? I'm getting out of control here. Let me get back to this verse. What are you receiving? What kind of instruction? Seriously. Think about what they're doing. Right? And number one bestsellers through prior marketing with 12 steps to becoming godly and 12 steps to pray. Think about it for a minute. Pyre marketing is when you buy the first couple 20,000 books so that it becomes a national bestseller overnight and everybody thinks it was full of wisdom. And then you want to buy it because it's a number one bestseller. And you think, I don't want to miss out on what everybody else is getting. I got to go buy that album. I got to go buy that book. Everybody's doing it. Businesses are doing it. They borrow money to do more advertising to make you think they're bigger than they are. It's a lie because they're earning the sway of the wicked one because everybody loves money and their own name and their own power and the love of money is the root of all evil because we think it gives us power and a name and the only name we really should be lifting up is the name above all names, Jesus. So receive instruction. It's okay to receive chastisement, reproof, warning, Correction. That's why I love about 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I went there, didn't I? All scripture is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is telling you how to live. Reproof is telling you when you're not doing it. Right? For correction. Correction stands you back up again. It's not just don't, but the correction tells you the right way to do it. Stands you back up again. In the, in the ancient world, in it, 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 they, they would have like a bust that was knocked over. It was just art, but it was there as a trophy of grace for you to look at. It might have been Caesar's head, and it would get knocked over, and they'd go, correct that. And they'd stand it back up again and put it in the place it's supposed to be. That's what the grace of God does for us. It stands us back up. It corrects us. It's already told us how to live, and then when we don't do it right, it, cor it reproves us, and then it corrects us. And what's it doing while it's correcting us? The chastisement. It's so that we can receive instruction in righteousness. So that we can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Because that's what we're called to do, right? We're, work, we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Ephesians 2.10. That's what we want to do. We want to we finish his plan with our lives. It's amazing stuff, really. Isn't it amazing stuff, guys? You guys like this? Yeah. I love it. I wish I could do it. I mean, I talk about it. It's really easy to talk about it. But we want to aim in the right direction. Aim our arrows. Aim our life. Aim our soul. Allow the Spirit to lead us. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. We're almost finished. I got my first of 13 closes right now. Why would we receive this instruction that 
we may be wise in our latter days. Actually, that we might be able to teach wisdom. Actually, that we may be able to deal with life wisely. Or it could mean to make wiser. Because listen, if you actually hear the counsel, that's the beginning of wisdom. And then if you keep applying it and listening and receive it, then you're going to get wiser in it. It's that simple. Do it with anything. Well, why am I taking 102 this year? Because you took 101 last year. And so you're going to get wiser now. We prepped you for it. It's the same way in the reverse. I'm serious. In anything you've ever done, it's the same way in the reverse. You have to go through the beginning. Then you move up and you move up. You start on milk. You move to meat. It's okay. It's okay to be a disciple, to follow, to learn, to be in the same way with. And in your latter days, some, some say this is that, that we cross the finish line. The latter days, the last days it could be. You know, every day since Jesus ascended is the last days. And we need wisdom right now. Yeah, I know, I'm moving quicker. The first usage on the, uh, maybe wise, no instruction was Deuteronomy 11.2. Uh, latter days, ooh, Genesis 49. Anybody know what that is, Genesis 49.1? That's the first usage. What's going on there? Remember, Jacob leaning on a staff, giving instruction of what's going to happen in the latter days. 49.1, am I right? Yeah, that's right. I think I'm right. Okay, stop. The father is gathering his children, his sons, and he's telling us what's going to happen in the last days, right? That's what the Bible's all about. From beginning to end, as a father, and not only does that father tell us, but he sends his only begotten son to do it in front of us as an example so that we can have life if we just believe that his son did it. And Jacob is that type of father right here. He's being that type. But he's telling us, that's, a, that's right there, the last days, that's the first usage of it. And think about it, everything. We're getting ready to close it. Chapter 50, Genesis. Every bit of it in Genesis. Everything that you do in life begins in Genesis with origins. In fact, it all starts with in. Because if you're in Christ, when was that in? It was in the beginning. Because when God spoke, he started it all into motion. Bera ex nihilo, out of nothing. He spoke it into existence, and now we can have salvation and fellowship with God for eternity. I love this stuff. I'm going back to uh, Proverbs 19, and we'll try to close. I know you guys have been working hard all day, so you're tired. But there's another verse. Remember I tell you that Proverbs is written in some different ways. Sometimes the first line uh, uh, it, it tells you one thing and then the second line reinforces it uh, uh, and I forget what they're called parallelisms I think and they keep reinforcing it well here verse 20 and verse 21 are parallelisms themselves and if you'll notice they just kind of changed it they changed it a little bit and so we're going to listen to count or we're going to hear intelligently counsel and receive that instruction so that we can be wise in our latter days and know how to walk this out and not fall for the lives of the wicked one. Because right now they're raising up prophets to deceive the elect if it were possible. And you might be following the wrong voice, caught up in a fight out there to save a nation, just like they were when they killed Jesus. It's John chapter 11. we got to kill one to save our place in our nation. Listen, that's what they're talking about today. But what we want to do is be wise enough not to enter into the fray, not to get involved in the physical fight, and stay focused on saving souls by being a witness because we're talking about what we hear in the Word of God. Not in the newspaper, not from the mediums, not from the spirits, not because of channeling. Listen, in the Word of God, the only spirit that we're supposed to listen to. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, the called out ones. This is not our home. 
So then he says this, 21, let's reinforce it, parallel verse. There are many plans, many plans, and the King James, guess what it is? You'll never guess, unless you got a King James, devices. Hmm. Isn't that weird? It's really, <laughs> I'm sorry, the word of God is not weird, but it's weird that it's devices. Uh, there are many plants, devices, uh, we'll give you some more here in a minute, in a man's heart, the middle of him, the part that Christ died to save, the middle of us. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, the Lord's plan, the Lord's advice, the Lord's purposes, that will stand. Now listen, that's our place. Ephesians, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, having, uh, uh, above all, taking up the shield of faith where which you will be able to, be able to, I'm going to do a verse, I'm going to do one on Abel eventually. Quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, putting on the helmet of salvation, taking up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, Remember, it has to be by the Spirit. You can pray all day long. And you'll be praying amiss if you're not praying with the Spirit leading you. Because you'll be praying for selfish reasons. You'll be praying for the wrong reasons. You'll be praying to use it on yourself. You discovered it in James. Praying for the wrong reasons if it's not by the Spirit of God. Is that in chapter 4, James? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> you're good. I got him to go off somewhere else. He's thinking. So, the plans, listen, listen, there are many plans, many devices, many contrivances, listen, here it is, many intentions or thoughts that a man has, many in our hearts, man, I want to do good for God, Josiah said, you five, you seven, you ten, you go to the temple and you rebuild that stuff that's broken. Hey, O okay, king, we did that, but look what they sent back. They sent back the word of God. He reads it and rips his clothes, and he revives. See, he had a plan. He had intentions. He wanted to do good for God, but he tried to do it himself without the instruction of God. He tried to do it himself without the ways of God and the character of God. He was following his dad. He was following his grandpa, Hezekiah. He was following other people that are trying to build the kingdom of God, but they're not doing it joining each other together. They're not doing it receiving the mind of Christ through the Spirit of God. They're building their own little kingdoms, which nobody needs to do. So there's many plans I got many plans. You know, one of the one of the biggest things I I've been saying it for fifteen years, and you guys have been here, you know it. If the church is apostate, and it is, then we're not just going to run around doing the exact same thing that every other church is doing because they're apostate. So we're going to sit still and keep praying and wait for God to tell us what to do. Because why should we run around? Because I've heard people teach, just do something, and it's 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 harder to hit a target moving. Well, I ain't trying to hit nothing. And I don't want nobody hitting me. That was my old life. <laughs> Quit hitting me. I already found the target. It's the righteous one. It's Christ. So we need to be still. We can't just do food banks and all of these ministries and go, let's just do everything everybody else is doing. If they're apostate, they're not hearing from God. They're just making a bunch of mud. And I'm not saying anything bad because some people would take offense to that. Well, at least we're doing good. How do you know it's good? You can actually be doing something that looks good and it's bad because you're being disobedient to God. If it's not being done by the Spirit of God, there's none of the filthy rags that you have. So it can actually look great, Mother Teresa, and it be from the pit of hell. Think about it long and hard. We don't get this. A heart that wants to obey God and fails is better than a heart that wants to take and make a name for itself and does something morally right. Because you're looking to hear and receive and obey and follow God. But you go, I can't do it, Lord. I keep messing up. That's a better heart than somebody that's playing religion, that's pretending, that's serving at the soup kitchen and thinking that their works are going to get them somewhere. 
The heart that understands it's in a ditch is better. The heart that understands that if I don't shut my heart down and stop chasing my desires and my plans and my ways, because there's many of them in me, and they all wrestle against God. Because he's already got a plan. So your plans are no good. Scrap them. They're bad. They're filthy rags. Scrap them. Let's go back. I'm sorry. We're late. Intentions. Um, first usage. Where is it? Anybody know? Genesis 6, 5. Where God relented that he created man because every thought and intent and plan of their heart was evil continually. And he said all the days of man will be 120 years. Guess what, though? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because he believed God. And it was accounted to him as righteousness. And there was eight people in that family, which is the number of new beginnings, that got into the ark. They went into the ark because they obeyed God. And God did all the work. He brought all the animals. They didn't go out with a whip and go, you're going to obey because we got to load you on this ark one of these days and crack the whip and go, we're training them. We're the whispers. No, they just went and was faithful to do what God called them to do, and God brought them in two by two. Seven pairs of the clean, two pairs of the unclean. Don't believe your posters. The cartoons are always a lie. They always mess it up when they try to simplify God's word. It's already simplified. Listen to me. It's already simple if you let the Spirit of God teach you. This book is already simple. As simple as it get, a small child can understand it. But if you try to make it easy with your own understanding, you'll muddy it up real fast. Believe me, I do it. Who is it that muddies counsel? God would say to those miserable counselors and to Job. Not just to the miserable counselors. And you would think Job was this righteous man that God tested and allowed the devil. But he's like, no, you all muddied counsel. Ain't none righteous, not one. Be still. All right, so first huge is, is actually when they're dealing with the giant or dealing with the uh, Nephilim. They're dealing with the spirits, the demons that have left their proper domain. And that's what we're dealing with today. And we need to be wise enough to wake up and know we need to hear the word of God, not the channels, not the spirits, not the mediums, not the politics, not the battle in the street. But it's the battle in your heart, your plans. That's what you need to die to, your desires. Take off the old man, put on the new man, and walk in the newness of life by the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he actually says it again, if you want to see it in the New Testament, it's Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide the bone and the marrow, the soul and the spirit. And what? It's a discerner of the plans, the thoughts, the intentions of the heart. And that's why you want to be in the word and hear his voice and go, no, Greg, that's you. That's your plans. That's your intentions. That's your heart. But over here, I'm dividing it. And you can see the spiritual and you can be divided and see the flesh. And you can learn to recognize your flesh when it's creeping up on you and you <laughs> right in the face. <laughs> Just hit it right in the face and put dirt on its head right back in the grave and say, you stay down. I'm sorry, that's mean, isn't it? Shouldn't hit people like that. <laughs> oh, that's myself. Yeah, I should. My, my Bible study leader used to do that. He said he'd get up in the morning, Mike Abney, he'd go, no, 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 and just say no to himself instantly because he knew he was going to get up and try to go out and do his own plans. Okay, so um, many or the intentions and the thoughts and the devices. Here it is. The plans. Uh, Proverbs 16.3. Commit thy works unto the Lord and your thoughts, your devices, your plans will be established. Now don't go read it in the ESV because it's really jacked up. Don't go reading it in some of them other Bibles. It's jacked up. I'm serious. Tell God what you're doing and he'll come and bless it. That's what they want to say. No, 
You know, you, you got to take the full counsel of God. Die to your plans. Commit your works to his plan, and your plans will be established because he's already established his. There's only one plan. By the way, that's next week's verse, Proverbs 16, 3. Let's close this. It takes a while to close it. I really wanted to go to Isaiah 30. Isaiah 31. Remember, God was bringing judgment. And he says, don't go down to Egypt to get counsel. Egypt has nothing but horses and chariots. And if everyone who trusts in them will die. And see, that's what the church is doing. That's what the people are doing. They're going to the world. Egypt is a type of the world. It's run by Satan. It's earning to sway the wicked one. Pharaoh. And he told him when he was bringing the judgment upon Judah, don't go to Egypt and look for help. Where is the church running to? They're running to the mediums and the spirits and the, and, and the voices that are all coming to a convergence. They don't care that all of them are, are here you got the Catholics and you got the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons and you got the people that don't even believe in God. You got some of the, the best conservatives and you may have read about this, said, hey, guys, just watch pornography instead of cheating on your wife. That's their advice, because that's the ungodly world. That Instead of cheating on your wife, just watch some pornography. See, they don't know the word of God, and they give the counsel of God as a conservative that they're need to sway the wicked ones, but they're in the same box as us. No, they're not. They're lost, and they need Jesus and they need to be rebuked for counsel like that. Because all that does is do what, guys? Trains the heart to desire more. Dead to your plans. Dead to what you want to do. Not, not trying to feed your flesh, but bury it. Punch it in the face again. Kick it in the head. Shove it in a grave. Put a couple buckets of dirt on it. And say, no, no, no. Sorry, I'm all the way off topic here, but... There was one of the great conservatives that's on Fox all the time, and they quote him constantly. That was his advice. I think at best he was a Catholic. That was his advice. At least you won't cheat on your wife physically. You can keep your marriage together. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. What does it say? Nevertheless, oh, uh, nevertheless the Lord's counsel. It actually says in the King James, nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the sub-existing one, shall stand. Now get this. If you look it up, it means to rise. That's what it means. What does stand mean? It means to stand back up again. We were dead, and we stood back up again. It will rise. It will abide and continue and remain. God's counsel is always, his plan's never going anywhere. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not. And that's what his counsel is. That's what his advice is. That's what he's using to save the land, to save the souls, is his word. It's going to rise. It rose from the grave. He got up. That's the evidence that he was the Messiah. And the evidence that we believe him is that we also die. And then raised in the newness of life, in resurrection. And so it means to be clearer. It will abide, continue, remain. First usage. I told you I'd get to that, didn't I? First usage. What was it? God's counsel. Why is your countenance falling, Cain? If you do well, it'll go good with you. But what did he do? He's mad because Abel was worshiping God. Abel was obeying God by faith. And he rose up and killed his brother. That's the first usage of that word. He rose. Instead of rising and letting God's counsel stand, he rose up and disobeyed God. Look, look we can read about it in Hebrews 11.4. You know, Hebrews 11 is the Hall of Faith chapter. We're going long. Sorry. We always go long. If you've been here, you know that. 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Listen, you can say you believe all day long, but there should be some evidence of things not seen, the Spirit of God in your life, because you're changing. Abel was the first prophet, the first one to bring the Word of God, the first one to witness of God, and what happened? 
the murderer from the beginning came, killed him. He rose up and killed him. And that's what happens, is the spirit of Antichrist is rising up and wants to kill the counsel of God, the word of God, and keep you and I from hearing it because we're listening to everything else. But it actually says this right here, 11.4. How did he do it? By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice. More excellent. Love chapter. Let, yet I show you a more excellent way. Chapter 13. Love. More excellent. Sacrifice than Cain. Through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Well, how, how do you know that? God testifying, anybody believe God, of his gifts. And through it, being dead still speaks. Today, that first prophet, Abel, still speaks. His righteous blood cries from the ground. Don't listen to the world's counsel. Hear God's counsel. Hear God's word. Hear what God is saying to the church through the Spirit. Receive instruction that you may be wise or wiser in your latter days. It's supposed to be always on the grow. You're becoming wiser. You're growing. It's a process of sanctification. As you learn and you share, you own, and you become the children of God. Next week, Proverbs 16, 3. Commit your works unto the Lord and your thoughts, your plans will be established. Firm foundation. Because if you commit your works to the Lord, you're going to choose his plan. And it's got a firm foundation. It can't be moved. Amen? Questions, comments, concerns? Done. Sorry, I've got it wrong by one verse. Mm -hmm. They would have found it. <laughs> <laughs> I was close. I mean, you show up and then you see the car. Wrong address, but it was next door. Okay. Oh, never mind. <laughs> My brain thinks weird. <laughs> so Proverbs 16, 3. Write it down, memorize it, meditate on it. Think about it. What does it mean? Look it up. Search it out. Great stuff in the Proverbs. Great stuff. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for opening our eyes and ears and Lord we struggle so much so help us to hear build our faith we believe but help our unbelief that we would step out of the boat we're in and we would share your son Jesus with whoever we meet not just by word Lord we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by your word but also our actions just as Jesus began to do and to teach Help us to be doers and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Lord bless you.